It's a high-tech conversation. On the low-tech topic. Live on the World Wide Web via Zoom. Bench Talk 101. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Bench Talk 101. This week, we're joined by uh, Gustave Grimont, uh, if I pronounce that correctly. I'm not sure. Um, so Gustave's a carpenter in France, and he specializes or uh, mostly does hand tool woodworking, one or the other. Um, and uh, I probably won't do this introduction too much justice. So I'm going to hand over to Gustave and give him a chance to uh, introduce himself in with better justice, I guess, to it. Over to well, you, uh, Gustav. Yeah. Well, hello. So, yeah, I'm Gustav. So, yeah, as uh, Sharon, Sharon Rick said, um, so yeah, I'm a hand, hand tool woodworker, mostly timber framer. Uh, and yeah, mostly specialized more and more into a part of our experimental archaeology, but also to doing our experimental archaeology, I've realized that most of those hand tools uh, are very, very efficient. So once you get used to them properly, well, you can use them just as fast as uh, power tools uh, on a job site. Uh, so doing experimental archaeology gave me the opportunity to uh, work more, mostly by hand on more than everyday job sites uh, to make any kind of building and construction uh, work. So uh, for hand tool woodworking uh, in framing, uh, the most important tool that I'm going to use, and it's the one I'm going to talk about tonight, is the axe. Uh, so the axe, like we were just saying before uh, the talk started, is one of uh, humanity's first tool. Uh, it ran well from Stone axe, which come well, different kind of stone polish, polish axe, uh, like this one, a flint uh, axe. Then we go to bronze, bronze age, where we arrived at bronze tools and axes. Uh, and I'm going to get now to screen share so I can show you some pictures. Uh, so we have bronze axes. They come in way different, same pattern and uh, style. Here, normally, you should be able to see a bronze axe. Uh, this one is in Scotland, Dumfries Museum. Uh, which you want to go, they have a nice, very great collection of uh, bronze uh, axes. That's uh, middle bronze age, roughly period. Quite a heavy one, which is about about ten centimeters long, or like uh, four inches, or the word people speaking in inches. Um, and this one is a bit less than 500 grams. Uh, so yeah, bronze. And then when we get to the bronze uh, age uh, finished, we got to some uh, steel tools, well, iron tools first, then steel tools. And then we get to have uh, a lot of evolution from uh, steel and iron tools that were basically the same pattern as iron axe or bronze axe. And then they started developing the axe that we know today with different ways of uh, attaching the handles to the, uh, to the axe, uh, which is uh, different ways of attaching, yeah, so different ways of attaching the handle to the, the axe. And then uh, developing the shapes, geometries, the head, edge lengths, and everything through time. Um, so, yeah, axes they come in different weights, size. Uh, I'm just going to do a very quick uh, explanation of um, uh, what, how I'm going to call each part of an axe. So if I take this one, uh, we have well, the edge. The edge has its own uh, bevel geometry. Then we have um, what I'm going to call the color of the axe, which is the distance from the edge to the handle. Then we have the profile of the axe, which is the shape of the earth this way. It's going to have some influence on the usage of the axe and how you're going to use it. Then you have, well, the handling method, the way to attach the handle to the axe. Here on this one, we have a socket axe, uh, which is basically a hollow tube that's tapered. And the axe is only fitted with friction. The handle is fitted with friction. We have also some. Uh, 
like this one, which would be called a slip fits handle, which the handles come this way and is tapered all the way down. So it's thicker here and thinner here to the other. It holds just the axe this way. And we would have the third most common way of attacking the handle, which I'm going to call the classical type, which is you have the handle getting thin on the bottom of the eye, and then you have a wedge on the top holding the handle to the axe head. And then the last, um, I would say, part of the axe would be, I would call the back of the axe, which is well, here, on this case here, a hammer. So um, with those, those, oh, and there's a, uh, the third thing that, oh, what, no, no, the third thing, another thing that's important to notice is the, align, the alignment of the edge with the handle. So it can be parallel, open, align, which is also parallel, the edge is parallel to the handle. Open would be if the edge has an angle that is like this. Then we have a line, it's the edge is a line with the hand end of the handle. And inwards, if it's the edge is like bumping in the handle, and you can have a small handle there. Uh, that would be the principal characteristic you could see on an axe. And I'm going to say how we're going to use it on different tasks and work, and also depending on personal preference. Uh, because well, the axe, uh, until the Industrial Revolution, uh, was mostly made only by a toolsmith making the axe for the user. So every axe or tool, any woodworking tool that I have, will be basically custom fit for the user. So someone my size and my weight and my edge uh, wouldn't be using the same axe than someone taller, smaller, heavier, or like skinnier, or anything like this. Uh, so that's why we have also that wide variety of shaping patterns in axes. Uh, so uh, maybe here most of you are used uh, to use axes, maybe, I don't know, for uh, carving spoons or for like uh, Blank, uh, blank making before making chairs uh, or like small things. But the axe, uh, I would compare it, like I say, it's it's my primary tool when working in my everyday job. And I could really, for me, the only modern tools that I could compare it to would be a chainsaw. It's the axe is really a tool in which once you get used to it, you can go from the tree to the complete finished house, no problem doing every task only with your axe, basically. So uh, for the explanation, back to the screen share. So uh, in many of the projects I've been able to make, I have been able to make, um, how can I get it up there? This building here, this building uh, that uh, was made so it's uh, three meters by six in sweet chestnut. Uh, and the only tool that was used to make that concrete building is those tools here. So uh, on that construction, uh, I was uh, teaching someone. So basically, we both had uh, a chisel each. We had an auger. So we had here two diameters of auger. And we both decided to just, because we weren't just trying to be uh, minimalistic, just to have each two axes, which is more a forestry axe and a carpentry axe. So those are my two axes, my forestry, every task axe, and my more precise carpentry axe or like timber framing axe plus some like basic levels or could have been a plumbo tracing material to a pencil or chalk or anything else calipers 
a tape because we're lazy and we don't want to use a stick and just some strings basically. So with those very basic tool, we were able to make a complete house. Uh, so from the tree felling, of course, which is the axis to uh, mine for felling, uh, but also well hewing. So I don't know how many uh, all of you here watching uh, are used to hewing, but basically hewing is uh, going from a tree of a log uh, to a finished beam that's going to be used in construction uh, most of the time. So back to uh, sharing screen. Uh, uh, so hewing. Here we have an example of like ex extremely straight and clean hewing uh, that I had to make for a job site in Czech Republic. Um, so you get from the log that you can see on the side. You make notches on the log roughly every. I have some photos of this somewhere in somewhere I imagine. Uh, not here, but you make some notches and then. You just come with your axe and clean the face to have straight or curve, depending on the need, uh, beam that you can use in your construction uh, site. Uh, so that's one thing timbers for your construction parts. Um, one, one other thing that can be used sometimes you'll need smaller uh, lumber for your construction. And then you can use with the axe saying make some small wedges. And do some splitting. Here is some splitting of uh, well oak to make well uh, three inches by two inches uh, cars that could be used, for example, for rafters. Here they were used for a crane, a wooden crane, uh, where we need smaller uh, lumbers. So same with the axe it can also be very use useful for these parts. The after there's all the tracing part, which is well, not real X work or directly X work related. But as you can see, uh, you need to, if you want to work only with an X, you'll need to uh, choose a joinery you're going to make. And here there's uh, one incredible joint to make with an X. It's a dovetail. The dovetail, you can make male and female parts of the doctor, dovetail only with an X. So for example, here, we have an example of a sliding dovetail uh, made with an axle. In the making process, I haven't I haven't got a photo where uh, I have removed this bulk in the middle. But basically, you just cut or chop out the dovetail with an axe. Uh, I can come afterwards if you want. Maybe if you want very precise details on how the process to chop a dovetail or a tenon with an axe to a straight line. Afterwards, maybe more in the question room if someone's interested, just tell me and I'll take your time to explain this. So, yeah, you can make sliding dovetails like here, uh, but also here are more typical dovetails or here a tenon. So, we can go more this way so you have a better view of it. There, so dovetail tenons can be made easily only with an axe uh, here on the side, in the middle, a middle. Side the dovetail, middle dovetail, uh, close with an axe. And here, for example, this building uh, was only made with well uh, axes, chisel, and auger, um, and quite those because we wanted to have fun with the wearables of this one. Uh, so, yeah, you can really make complex structures with, those, with that tool, no problem. Uh, I would say one of his. Uh, limits uh, would be sometimes when you have a very steep angle that you can't really clean. Uh, the use of an axe, well, and that's come also with different shapes and patterns. Uh, well, you have the mortise parts uh, question for the axe, and for that part, you have what's called the mortising axe, which is the mortising axe. Which is basically an axe with a very small edge. Uh, that's well, here you can use, well, here was made to dug out, uh, well, rough out, uh, well, a pivoting point for a crane. So you can really chop it out and a lot faster since you're foreign. You're basically, once you're used to work with an axe, you hit between one to two hits per second. 
So that's quite fast. So you can chop out, chop, chop out uh, joinery a lot faster um, than you could do with a chisel, for example. Uh, another use of the mortising axe would be, for example, here on this one. That's for a pole lathe uh, where you have the long full mortise. You can chop the mortise with that with that axe, no problem. You have a lot of, of limits when it's come to option to make joinery with an axe. Then, so yeah, so like I was saying, so you can go to very fine detail work um, and then get to like. I would say just making dovetails, tenon hewing, uh, molded, still quite basic joinery, and used mostly on framing, so where you can get some quite coarse results uh, and more or less precise. But uh, you can also get, like for example, here, that's a plank making for chests. So uh, you, you split your log uh, to prepare for some plank. And then you hew exactly like you would hew a bigger log or to make a big beam for timber framing. You could hew those small planks and like even even here, make angle plank. Let that plank come at the bottom of a chest to hold the well the end, the, the bottom of the chest. So you don't have like a groove on the side of the chest uh, to hold the, the bottom of it. Same here. Uh, well. Here on this part here, uh, for this plank, it's just making a um, common groove joinery. Uh, so to make the groove, you could do it with an axe if your planks are thick enough. Otherwise, you usually in medieval pay, uh, you would mostly do it with um, a racing knife. But here, you have half of a groove made uh, of a tenon, tenon groove or tenon groove joint, same for a chest, for example. Uh, and with that, mostly axe work, really you can get to some, well, like here, refine and clean pieces. Here, basically, to make that chest, uh, it's an axe. Uh, I have a weird uh, custom uh, hand plane. And, um, and uh, brace and bits to make some holes. And that's it. Uh, you don't need any chisel uh, or any other things. You could use chisel if you want to, because that's quite a basic tool. But you can get easily without it once you get used to use the axe. Um, so one of the photo to explain this. So yeah, some other weird things in being able like to make gutters with axes uh, without using an axe, because the axe. Uh, well, I don't like the ad, so I don't want to use it. So use an axe instead. It's always a lot better and nicer. Uh, and here, like saying, making some like hidden dovetails. Same only only with the axe. Uh, so the um, I would say the key thing to be able to use the axe uh, for everyday uh, work is to. Um, is to be able to you need to think your building in a different way. You need to eliminate as much as possible all the joinery that's going to be uh, uh, to be uh, all the joinery that's going to be annoying to make with the with the with, with only an axe. Once you get rid of those, or well, just like playtime all the time, uh, basically. Then. So uh, I'm going to speak uh, speak briefly now uh, because well I don't have it all night. Once that now that I've shown you basically what can be done with an axe, uh, what's the different shape and geometry and edge sharpening that can be interesting with an axe. So I'm going to start with something very. Um, very always saying Frenchy, uh, which is these kind of axes. Uh, those are very typical in France. 
and very uh, all around axes that can be used. So they're very usually from, I would say, one and a half kilo to two and a half kilos. And you have, uh, on this one, you have a slip bit handle that comes from the top. And you have like a quite, quite nice, not too thin, not too thick edge. That's, of course, like the middle range, because you can go to some. Uh, extremely thin axis and you can also go to a little thicker axis so depending on the task you want to do you would want to choose the thickness of your axe um, basically a thinner axe would go deeper into the wood and split less than the thicker axe that would go less deep in the wood but split more easily. That's just a shortcut because there is some exception to this depending on your edge length and stuff like that. But uh, also the big advantage you have on a thin axe is you can get to a wider uh, edge length with the same weight, uh, which is that's something that was very well known in the middle period, I'm going to get an example. There. So to get to some extremely thin, thin axes, but that still gives you a very wide edge. With here an axe that's 1.2 kilo. So then you got this axe. Is the same weight than this one. If you get them side by side, you have one that's a little bigger in shape than the other one, the same weight and complete opposite geometry. So that's gonna, the axe gonna impact what you can do with it, of course, but basically you could do. And about anything with any axe, it's just going to be less or less efficient or more efficient. So to show this example, to illustrate that idea, uh, back to the sharing screen there. So here this is a sixth century axe uh, that was found in Alsace. Uh, this one is 300 grams. So imagine, well, you all see how light is 300 grams. I had this axe uh, reforged, reproduced, and well, you can hew with it. But well, it's a bit ridiculous when you see the size of the log compared to the axe, which is 300 grams. But you can work with it. And that's. Uh, that's a thing uh, that should be considered, uh, especially if you get more to axe woodworking for experimental archaeology. Usually, you start working on a woodworking project, and you have your more modern uh, woodworker mind mindset and habits of speed and producing technique. Uh, the thing is, like you have to realize that someone in the Stone Age, in a tree those stone axes, they don't know that this can exist. They, they can't even think about it, and they don't even imagine they can be a chainsaw. So for them, this is the most high-tech tool they can have. And so with this, they're going to do everything, and considering it's normal to take half a day to fell down a tree. Uh, to get the axes down. So yeah, the thickness of the axe is going to play in the usage, of course. And then you have the edge length, edge length. So if you go from for example, this one, which has almost 30 centimeter edge length, and you compare it to, oh, let's say this one, yeah, 
of course, they're not going to do the same job with. Um, the bigger, the longer your edge is, the easier it's going to be, well, the faster it's going to be to be working, but the less penetration you'll have. So, for example, getting to work on uh, dry timber, you don't want a long edge because dry timber is going to be harder to cut. So, you want a smaller edge. So, all your energy is concentrated in a smaller, uh, uh, a shorter length until you have a deeper cut. Also, the wider edge will give you the advantage uh, to have a cleaner surface when you, for example, you go to hewing, you build up faster because you'll be able to make a flat, well, let's say, first centimeter. And like this one, I'll be, be doing a flat on seven centimeters, which, of course, I'm going to be, I'm going to need to overlap my cut all the time if you want to have like a clean surface on like seven meters long. Or even like if you do a tenon shoulder, you'll need to overlap your cuts to make that shoulder on a like 15 centimeter tenon long, one tenon. So edge length will play in your efficiency and you'll have to choose if you prefer something that will go deeper all the time, but will make longer to make a, a clean cut or a long straight cut or something that will go less deep, but will have something cleaner, depending on personal preferences. Um, also on like more widened pattern uh, example. Uh, a lot of <laughs> here we have an American pattern felling axe. Uh, but don't worry, it's French and not American. It's an American pattern, French axe. Here, we have more French or Belgian pattern filling axe. So, um, also when I, about axe working, you'll need to consider the context in which you're working. So, are you doing experimental archaeology? Are you just having fun? Are you doing it as a hobby? Do you want to work with it and uh, earn your money working more like this. And those two axes, which are very different in shape and like profile here, are made for the same purpose, felling. And those two patterns have evolved uh, to uh, for felling uh, and is suited for what they were meant to fell. The American pattern is a pattern that's um, very well balanced. You have usually quite a lot of meat on the back of the ax. Uh, the edge, the color is very short. So you have a very good edge control on the ax. The edge is easy to control. Uh, and the American devil, well, Northern America developed that pattern suited for their use of wood and felling. They have basically, when they arrived, the or when the new world was discovered, they had an infinite quantity of wood. They didn't have to worry about wood waste. So they've developed this pattern. And when you see all photos of, of uh, felling in the Northern America, you'll see they're felling quite high from the ground, having the axe coming horizontal and then from the top to make the notch. Um, and they're making like wide knots. Uh, wide notches for felling. This pattern that was developed in Europe has the idea that we don't have that much forest, uh, well, less forest than what they have in America. So with these axes that are very long and thin, you can make a lot thinner notches and uh, you're almost going to cut into the ground, into the dirt, to cut the roots of the tree so you don't lose any, any length of the tree. You don't want to lose any centimeter. You want to keep everything of it. That, that's how this act will develop. But those two are two still, are, they're both still felling acts, but not for the same context. So that's why putting your tools back into their context will help you to under, understand them properly and then use them properly. Because if you want to start, for example, felling 
the French or Belgium way with those axes, you are gonna gonna break the handle every time, and you won't gonna be able to cut anything. And if you start using this one to feel like an American style or selling, well, you're gonna kill your wrist and your arms in no time because all the weight of the axe is here in the front. You have no balance on the back. So to send that axe horizontal on a tree to make an um, horizontal notch, a level notch for felling is a, a very hard and not a very nice task to do. They weren't made for this. This was made for it. This wasn't made to cut almost on the ground. This one was made for it. Uh, so yeah, context is going to be a very important part for your uh, axe work if you want to get used to it and try have a go at it. But but you could still do both with those axes. They're not going to be as efficient as if you use the proper one. So. Um, I think I'm going to let you ask questions because I could start speaking for a long, long time about access. Uh, and I think, well, maybe just you can ask questions, I'm going to answer, and then we can do that a long time, but answering questions instead of just me speaking and you having more and more questions to ask afterwards. So, yeah. Thank you very much, Gustav, for a brilliant talk. I think you've had us all, you've had all our attention just drawn right to you. Um, we haven't had anyone really talk about axes in detail. I think we had um, Rusty talk about his uh, a little bit about hewing when he came back from his last trip to France, which where I believe you met. Yeah. Um, so uh, if I think we've got quite a few new people today who've joined us. So if you haven't joined us before, if you want to ask us to have a question, if you put your name in the chat, I'll ask you to unmute when it's your turn to ask a question. Now uh, I think. If I see correctly, Rusty, you managed to find your way into the list first. So uh, over to you, Rusty. I need to unmute. Okay. Uh, so I have 74 questions, but I'm going to narrow it down to three. That's my nice friend. Yeah. Um, so the first one, you didn't talk about single bevel versus double bevel. Yeah, because single bevels are crap. I'm sorry, a single bevel of what? Crap, don't use that. <laughs> so hold on, the, the, isn't the baby single bevel? No, the baby is double bevel. Okay, all right. Well, no, but sorry, most just, of the human axes will be yeah, single just, bevel. Well, uh, yes and no. Um, uh, single bevel axes, uh, they've developed. Like, I'm going to start here surely just to shorten the spectrum because otherwise it's going to be too far for France. Basically, single bevel hewing axe appeared in the 17th century before it's only double bevel axe, before you have those kind of axes. So, that's uh, this one is a Czech, Rep this one is a reproduction from Czech Republic from a 13th century axe. And those, well, although it's very thin, it still has two bevel. Uh, and when you start, well, there is right now, there sadly. Uh, there isn't a lot of uh, oncological work on those single versus double bevel. Uh, but from my experience and from what you see from uh, findings in um, oncological findings, and when you look at the trace on buildings, uh, most of the trace that I see that before the 17th century are mostly double bevel axes. So I'm going to just share the screen for that part to show some photos of that here. So, uh, um, if we go to this here, for example, is a church in France. Uh, I don't know the exact period of the construction, but well, it's not 20th century, it's, it's older for sure. And in France, double bevel axes were used for finishing axes, well, until the end of hewing time and basically the 1950s. But here, if I zoom in, you can see all of those columns here laying around and that's typical trace of a double be double bevel axe by the way here you get some very interesting timber frame markings here mm. here and here you can see a triangle which is made with a uh, spoon auger instead of a wriggle uh, spiral auger uh, but that's another subject um so yeah those here you can see all of those like round and very gentle curves and that's basically 
uh, if I like to, so here you have those curves, but, but that's on a building. And if I go, for example, here, that's beam up hued, you have the same columns laying around here, all around. For example, on this one, or same on those here, you can see. And basically, uh, uh, there, so you can see me again. Uh, think of, I'm going to get a single bevel act out. We don't need that. So um, basically, think of your axe as a chisel. So if you have a chisel, it's flat on one side, a bevel on the other. That's as a one bevel axe. When you're chopping with your chisel, if you go bevel down, your chisel go in and then out. If you go bevel, uh, no, yeah, if you go and if you go bevel up, your chisel will like that go and stick down. Okay. When you're pairing with your chisel, saying you go bevel down and you make a very nice flat, but you can also pair with the bevel down and then you just like more, more rounded movements. So those colored with the, with the axe, it's a double bevel. So because you're, it's like bevel down with your chisel, your bevel's coming in and out with the bevel. If you flip, if you have uh, one, one bevel axe and you have that bevel, it would be like that, that chisel going straight down and having very, a lot straighter lines instead of those curved sculpts going around. So that's how you can distinguish uh, markings. There is some exception. You can have some one bevel axe doing those sculpts and you can have those two bevel axe doing some very straight lines like a single bevel. That's also depending on edge geometry, angle and stuff like that. But basically that is. And but also the thing. edge on a single bevel X is not going to be straight like on a double bevel edge X, right? Oh. It usually is concave on the <laughs> no bevel side. So. I'm going to take an extreme example here. So that's a single bevel Swedish shooting X. So you can, yep. Yep. You can see one bevel. So on this side, the edge on a single bevel doesn't really matter its shape. What's going to matter is, of course, uh, exactly like you said, I don't have any straight edge laying around, but it's the flat side. You want to have the flat side is slightly curved. Uh, you can't yeah, see so that the corners don't dig in as you hear. Yeah, that's it. Uh, so the more curves you're going to have, the easier it's going to hew and you can do curved timbers. The straighter it's yeah. going to be, the harder it's going to use. But you're still going with the bevel on your log down. So it's you're going to make, you view from the top of the log, you're going to have the circle from this angle here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But your cut, they're going to still going to be biting into the log like with your chisel. Yeah. So the double bevel, it's going to, you have from the top, the curved shape from the top will be matching From the top, the curve with the double will be matching the edge of the axe. And from the side, it's going to be going out instead of biting, like with your chisel. And so the advantage of single versus double bevel, uh, it's personal preference, but basically with a double bevel, it's easier to forge uh, and a lot more versatile. A single bevel, you can only use it one-sided. Double bevel, you can turn around using for more, 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 more multiple tasks. I'm, I'm, I'm glad. Uh, I'm glad to hear that. Um, so my second question is about the Gitalon project. Uh, you have to say a few words about this. Uh, you worked there for a year and a half, right? Yeah. That's it. Uh, what was that like? What, what was involved? You living on the premises? Are you living the life of 13th century? No, 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 no. It's like it's you're an employee there, so you like. You go there, you do your normal hours, and then you go back to your home and do your life. Uh, so basically, I work there, I go back to my home, do more carpentry, sleep, wake up, go there, and then again every day, basically. That's for me. Um, so you're time traveling between yeah. the 21st yeah. century yeah. and 13th century. It's, it's quite tiring. You get used to it, but it can be quite tiring sometimes. Um, but yeah, so it's, yeah, it's a very interesting project where you, well, for those who don't know, in France, uh, 
the making of a 13th century castle using mostly 13th century technique. And that's where I'm going to get picky, and that's why I'm not working there anymore. Because for me, they weren't going far enough into the experimental part of it. Mm. Uh, they were too much just scratching the surface of something and then stopping because otherwise they're going to just go so far off. And so 20 years ago when they started, they've done a lot of research and a huge work. But now they're a bit too much just uh, sitting on the, what they've already done instead of continuing searching. And I've arrived there, uh, I've been given the task of managing the timber framing apart. Uh, and the thing like, all the team there, like the workers are great and really want to work. But the management there, they're slowly driving more toward the touristic part than the archaeological part, which is not the city but it's still a very great project with a lot of things. And it's a great way to have a first glance of what's medieval working, basically. Uh, but our experimental archaeology, well, I was the only one trying to have a 13th century axe on a 13th century project. So basically, that's why I stopped. I would say. Mm. Okay, well, the last question is, is a little bit of a joke. And, and um, I, I think that... I, th I thought we were playing a joke on you, but I think at the end you were playing a joke on me. So when you came to Amboise, uh, Paul told me that you only talk about access. And in fact, he gave me a challenge to find yeah. a subject that you can talk about that's not going to involve an axe. Yeah, I do cut case with access if that's a question. That's exactly where I was going. So <laughs> I asked you if in France people do get uh, a birthday cake if you have this tradition and your response was yes but you can't cut it with an axe it doesn't work i tried yeah. so the joke well, was on me indeed yeah but the good thing to know is well it depends on the axe because when i've used when i've tried to cut cakes with axes i had a quite an intermediate geometry axis and it's basically squishing the cake instead <laughs> of cutting it properly but if you go with the proper <laughs> but now you have the right axe for it I'm sure you can cut the cake quite nicely with it because to cut uh, to cut uh, vegetables it's great, and to cut pizza like you've seen. The, oh Omar, yeah, no, I remember. The, yeah, great. the last night. Yeah. Okay, I'll stop here, Gustav. We'll talk soon. I'm hoping to be there in July. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. No Cheers, Rusty. That was brilliant. You've left me chuckling there. Um, okay, so Matthias is making his way back to the back to being the first person to ask a question. He's number two this week. Over to you, Matthias. Thank you, and thank you very much, Gustav. That was fascinating, absolutely fascinating. Uh, a couple of questions. The first one on the experimental side of things. Yeah. Have you had a chance ever to try doing work with a replica Bronze Age axe? Uh, well, that's why I've got to, well, don't free museum in other parts, to have some measurement taken because I'm planning on having a Bronze Age produced uh, well, I hope quite soon, and then be able to try it out. Uh, but haven't tried tried it. I've tried stone. Well, uh, those kinds of stone axes. Yes. Uh, different type of iron and steel axes, but not the bronze yet. Okay, but uh, how do you expect the bronze to be? Uh, I mean, the, the layman's view would sort of be: isn't that a slightly softer metal than iron? I, I think I'm going to. Uh, I think I'm going to be quite surprised uh, because, well, uh, like I said, we need to get back to the mindset that that's the best thing they have. Yes. And I've been able to work with axes that have lost their temper and so were very soft already. Uh, it just, you, do, you just go very slow and try to avoid knots. Right. Uh, and have green timber and then works quite well. Uh, and bronze, basically, you don't sharpen bronze tools. With a stone like you do a, a heart, oh, right. you hammer it like you do a scythe. Okay. To harden the edge, and you like to basically squeeze the molecules of each other to have that edge. So, okay. I, I, quite, I think I'm going to be quite surprised. And basically, also, same on getting on the mindset. Like, I've, sh I've shown a picture of me cube of a uh, hewn timbers with uh, that six century axe, very tiny axe. Uh, that was for fun because basically I'm pretty darn sure in the 6th century they wouldn't have been hewing the timbers or not that much. Like I've been very nice, clean, like you're used to seeing with like more modern timbers. Yeah. 
and that's it. Bronze Age tool, well, you're not going to use it for hewing. You're going to use it for other tasks. And yeah. same for axe tools. You're not going to hew with an axe tool. You're going to chop and drum and fell tree, basically. But yeah, yeah. That's, the, that's a future project. Uh, but right now, I'm mostly working for experimental part, uh, Roman period tools okay. for a project. And, and yeah, the Roman, they're quite surprising because basically they have 19th century tools in the first uh, century. So yeah. Blimey. Uh, another thing I was wondering about, uh, when you were showing the, 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 the result you're capable of, of producing when you're hewing, yeah. uh, it, it's, uh, it looks absolutely amazing. To what sort of tolerances do you work? So, so say you have a beam that's maybe 10 meters long, how much of a deviation from perfectly straight is acceptable to you across those 10 meters? Well, it depends if I'm doing a chicken house or a castle. Of course. But that's uh, sort of in general. So uh, I'm going to show you uh, just because to something rough, easy, basically I would say easy. Mm. Uh, and I'm going to get back to uh, screen sharing there. Uh, if I go back to so there. So like I said, last year I went to a job site in Czech Republic mm -hmm. where we've been hewing for a castle, which is, if you want to look up on Google, it's Archen Castle, which is a 14th century castle, basically the biggest one in the Czech Republic. Yep. Uh, and we were, I would say, from six, well, from two to eight meters long. Mm -hmm. And that's the finished product there. Yeah. So here, uh, those logs, uh, they have roughly a feet, uh, a feet by a feet, about eight meters. Mm -hmm. uh, hewing, uh, we had the rule was to make the finishing work with uh, medieval style tool, tools, so double bevel, fin double bevel finishing axe. Yes. Uh, and basically here, uh, it had to be straight. <laughs> yep. We, we didn't have that. That was the the the, the order. Is like have something straight as possible, and so that gives you something like, uh, for example, uh, we have. Well, you can see where. Uh, it's a photo of Sean. Yeah, there. There. Yeah. So you have your line, you go straight. And on that one, uh, so I'm going to get back to uh, stop sharing your screen so I can show you what I'm doing. So when you do hewing, yeah. Uh, so. When you're hewing, uh, you have, I would say, your imaginary finished timber head. Yeah. And you want to have all those squares. So what you do is you fix with lock dogs there on the angle on your bench so it doesn't move. And you shoot the face, and you your reference is a level, a plumb box. And so you make a square with, with the calipers, and then you just turn it around and do Address it back level and do the other side. Here in Czech Republic, from here to here, we had roughly 30 centimeters or feet. Yeah. And we needed to have less than three mils. So one sixteenth of an inch yes. of uh, false plumb. Yeah. That we had some some that were a bit less well hewn, but that's what we were aiming to. Yeah. And that was the criteria and what we we're going to most of the time. Yes. So that's the how how much you can go to basically yeah that that, 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 that answers my questions perfectly thank you very much uh, and that that leads me on to, to my final question which was uh so when you're building something i can understand when when you work like when you're working on on a castle like that it basically there is a structure there already you're replacing parts of it it has to fit it uh, but but when you're building something from the ground up how much do you make the material fit the planning and how much do you adapt the planning on the way to fit the material well basically i do the planning depending on trees i have on site yeah so uh that's the rule like you make your building depending on the material yes uh, if you have some very precise for the building something medium then you say i need a tree like this and you yes. find a way to have that precise tree yeah. Uh, and the great thing when you do like the traditional timber framing is like 
you can have one, timbers as long as you want, you'll be able to put them in the building if you're good enough or lucky enough, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you very much. I'll uh, let someone else uh, get on and ask questions, but thank you. Thank you very much, Matthias. Uh, I think we're over to Josh now. Um, and also just pointing out, that I think that's the first time we've had a chalkboard on uh, Always a chalk. Yeah, so uh, I have two questions. One is about the socket axe. I, how do you keep the head on? Like, I, I see, like, do people just need to stand, you know, a good 10 or 20 feet away from you when you're using it for when it flies off, or does it stay on? Like, just that's a. It, it here very hard, so it doesn't get off. Okay, and, and it doesn't work loose, well, or, if, or you. If the socket is well forged, uh, if you have like if it's too much tapered, it's going to fly off, uh, and it's also depending on the length of the socket. Here, that's quite an intermediate intermediate term length, but you have some that have a lot longer sockets, so you have so you have more friction, just friction. But and so if, for example, if in the forging process they have a bump in the socket, then that handle is going to come loose a lot easier. Okay. So, I would say it's the big risk. The big advantage you have is that you have a handle that once it's fixed, it's not going to get any wiggle because you have all of this holding friction. So when you just chop and the height acts back and you take it off and in, off, in every day, most of the axe will sometimes, they're going to have a bit of wiggle in the handle. With this one, if it gets some wiggles, you just hit harder back there, it goes further in the socket and just hold back together very well. That's okay. one one in many of the big advantage of socket X. Okay, I, I guess the other question is you, you're you're hewing with a double bevel axe, but all of the profiles are very thin. Like if, if I look at a the Kent pattern single bevel that's really common here, uh, it's it's still a, a a thicker profile I, I think than your double bevel, and I, I wonder if like you, you could some queuing, but I'm gonna get some anyway. I've hewn some log with this one, which is like big triangle. Okay. Yeah. No, works no no big deal. It's just that like I said, those two are the same weight. Well with this right. one I have a 10 centimeter edge, this one I have a 20 centimeter edge. And also the big difference you have with a single and double bevel wax is well back to the troll. there so when you're hewing basically you're aiming to have this side flat so with the single bevel axe you have your axe the bevel axe here and the handle usually is crooked on the side so it doesn't hit your fingers with this double bevel axe you have that bevel here i know you can't see it here uh, so you have your like double bevel here there, I would say an extreme bevel just for the sake of the argument. Yeah. And then you have your, your edge here and your eye here. So if the color, the distance from the eye to the edge is quite short, you don't have the space, if that's the face of the log, to have your hands off so you don't bump your hands in the log. So the longer you have, the, the more, the biggest you can hew with it. So that's why. For example, some traditional uh, some traditional French double bevel leaning axe are like this. They're okay, very yeah. far off, so you can get your hands. And well, they have to be quite some are quite so thick and they're quite heavy with the axe. Oh, okay. And, and there's no uh it it seems with the angle you have to come at with a very thin profile, there'd be, if you don't know what you're doing, like, you know, not you, but if I were doing that, I would be worried about bending the, the head of the ax because it, it's, it's, it's so thin and it, it's uh it's that not a problem or. Well, like on uh, this, that's that 13th century ax, which is like. Right. Eighth of thin. That's the one we're using in Czech Republic to do some hewing, those big timbers that you're showing pictures of. So those are thin and fragile axe, basically. But you're not going to bend it just hitting the wood with it. 
except if you have like a forge uh, forge well problem, then you can then. Okay. But normally, it shouldn't be a problem. But it's so it's, it, it it would break before it bends. Or... Yeah, basically. Or if it bends, is that there, there's a big problem in the overall profile. But like here, but this one, it's thin, and that's also very thin. So it's like that's scary to use when you start using it. You're gonna think you're gonna break it like this, and we were hewing uh, frozen oak with those. So they okay. were hard stuff yes. and no problem. Okay. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Josh. I think we're on to Nevin. Uh, no good stuff. Just <laughs> Hello. Um, I watched uh, an interesting, oh, uh, yeah, an interesting uh, video that was produced in the 90s by a guy named Dan Dustin, who used to work up in New Hampshire at the Shaker Village up there. But anyways, he, he's teaching hewing, and he's actually using an early or an 18th century American or English Anglo-American pattern single bevel axe, but with the bevel turned toward the, the, the hewn surface to get those scallop marks on a straight handle. And he made an economic argument, which I just wanted to hear your uh, uh, opinion on, whether it was, a, it, was a, it was a cheaper way or an easier way to produce uh, an ax rather than striking two bevels onto it than to just to, to forge the, um, the, the body of the blade and, and just file in simply a single bevel and then stick it on a straight handle. Well, uh, I've seen that video. That's interesting. He's making some interesting points. And he's one point just before that answering the question. He's making the argument that when he looks at buildings, they have those colors and you need to have the bubble out to make those colors. But that's a perfectly arguable point. And he's right about that. But I've been speaking to different blacksmiths about that. And they're all arguing, Simon, Martin, and all this, that making one bevel axe is a lot harder because. <clears throat> If I go back to, well, if we get to that, that still that's the same one. So all all the axes, like you know, they have iron body and steel edge. So when you quench them, uh, the steel doesn't react the same than iron. Uh, so they're gonna war, and when you right. make a side axe. You, it's like a circle, so you have all the you still only on one side and all the iron. So, and mm -hmm. but one bevel, you need to have that steel on the side to be able to have one bevel. Right, right. So when you quench it, it's going to deform a lot more and you have a lot more chance of having cracks appearing in your edge with those deformation. Instead of those two bevels, which is kept in a sandwich in the middle. Also, right. other advantage you have while well, making this is if you have a forge rail problem somewhere in your edge, since it's in sandwich, you have a lot less chance of the edge breaking or getting loose because it's mm -hmm. you have more welding surface to hold the edge to the iron body. Interesting. Okay, I just wanted to run that. Well, then that brings me to another point that I don't know if you're uh, uh, familiar with what we call masting axes, but from from chatting with you. Um, they're all double bevel and they're very thin. Uh, I have two 18th century masting axes that I've used for hewing on straight handles, on shorter straight handles, and they're fantastic. And I, yeah, exactly. These, yeah, you have, a, that's a 19th century one, but similar. Yeah, that's, one, that's one for Maine. Yeah. Um, Is that a Higgins as well? Uh, nope. Nah. Roger something. So yeah, so how do you use those? Or, because those axes, uh, I've been playing, uh, that's the hewing axe I'm gonna use, hewing um, pine mostly mm -hmm. and uh, dry wood. I like it for dry wood a lot. Yeah. It's quite heavy. And what's nice with it, and I don't know if it's, I'm not a shipwright or a mat builder, so I don't know, if it's interesting for that point, but you have a quite a short edge on a very heavy axe with a quite a round profile and some nice rounded cheeks. And uh, what I've realized is when I'm hewing, uh, for example, 
dry wood or like very nasty curly wood like i've been hewing, hewing some oak horrible oak very very hard and like nasty curly grain uh if you get like my traditional french hewing i could have like 30 centimeter edge and quite thin like you're going to get some energy and it's going to just bite and do nothing mm. And having that white and that very small edge, that means that you have a lot of energy in a very small area. So you can go deeper and shoot more easily. And the other very nice thing. So you have those, usually with those cheeks, they help you to move the chip out. so It doesn't bend more. And that very rounded edge. So that makes you, well, a surface that has a very deep scallops in it. Mm -hmm. But the very interesting part is since uh, like like I was saying when uh, Rusty was asking about the the ball bevel, that profile of the edge uh, is what you see from the top. If you have your line, you're hewing basically, mm -hmm. and that's your line. You're not really hewing to the line. You are making those curves to the line. Right. Uh, so the negative of that profile. So if you have a very rounded edge, you're gonna basically. <laughs> I have a board that's nice. <laughs> so you have that very the line you want to hew. If you have a very straight edge, you're going to hew something like very long like this. Mm -hmm. So you're going to be, if you have nasty grain, you're going to take a lot of grain. But if you have the line in a very curved edge like this, you can dip and down, and you're not, you're just using the nasty grain from here to here instead of here to here. So you can go shoot a lot easier nasty grain with this kind of wood axis than with a straighter edge. And that's uh, something I've realized quite recently and works with the massing axe, mm -hmm. also from all the like uh, French typical Picard 19th century axe that are really like, uh, are very heavy with very rounded edge. And they used to shoot a lot of poplar and elm. Mm -hmm. And that's perfectly suited for like a simple poplar that's very, a pain to hew an elm that had very hard and twisted grain. So that's, I know maybe mats used to be quite tough uh, pine trees, so they don't break that easily. Maybe, I don't know. Uh, because I thought they were mostly straight, very clean grain, so they don't twist while drying. But maybe it was sort of other interest. That's one interesting point with the massing apps. That's what I'm doing there. It's interesting. I mean, having now gotten into a lot more historic buildings and working in more just in conservation. Point, just yeah. Basically, as Andy Brown just saying, same action as a gouge. Yeah, roughly, that's the idea, basically. Mm -hmm. There's a lot more variety to the hewing marks in, in New England than, than I think what's been previously recognized. So it's interesting to try to figure out who did it and how, how it was done. So yeah. And I have, I'm not an expert in uh, American tracing buildings, but it's true you have a lot of building with those like very deep scallops. Mm -hmm. Sometimes with those very deep but small scallops, and that could be made with a masking axe. Yes. Uh, I'm going to get some photos out uh, if you want to see the finishing work you have on the shoot so people can see what's the result of shooting with a masking axe uh, photo there. Uh, it's, it's there. There. Uh, so change screen there. 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 And you can see here, so that's, that's fine. That's dry pound. Pine was quite hard to hew. And you can see those very deep marks cut. And you can see the, the line over here. And you have those very marked rounded edge marks all around the edge so when you come afterwards working on on this uh timber thing like this it's not as nice to scribe but it's a lot easier to hew and also when i'm working thinking about that when you look at uh scandinavian acts like the um 17th uh o pattern uh bill ness or some very finishing uh finish axe that sometimes they were used to uh, clean back the face of uh, log buildings. Same, they were, from what I understand, quite using some dry pine trees. 
and they have that same very heavy and very rounded edge. So that might be an interesting point for fine work. Fine tree. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. Thank you very much, Nevin. I think we're on to Mr. Tuckwell, Andy. Hi. Um, well, thank you, Gustav. You've set me thinking about the the life of a 13th century carpenter that I've never thought about at all before. Yeah. Um, it's a nice life. <laughs> I've, I've seen the odd live demonstration of hewing at uh, shows and things, and maybe there they're working extra fast to look good, but it makes it look both efficient and a lot of hard work. Um, this is physical labour. And I wonder if anyone's got any sort of research or any idea of just how much work was expected of a 13th century carpenter. Oh. Yeah, were they hard at it all day long or was it hew really hard for a half an hour and then stop and mark something out or oh, think uh, about the next bit and then you know, go at it again? Or what was the life like? Well, we don't have a lot of information on those. Things. No. We have a lot more on the 19th century, for example. I can give you like time, hours per day, and like meter square student per day for a carpenter in the 19th century, at least in France, because that's where most of my research are. Uh, but hewing is, um, it's, well, it's a physical job, of course. Uh, but it's, I would consider like, uh, it's not, if I if you want to like sport, it's more like climbing or uh, marathon running. You're not, it's like just endurance because you just get the axe that's suited for you. Like, like I said in Czech, 1.2 kilo finishing axe. You're never going to find that in modern time axes uh, anywhere. Like it's, if you look at any 19th century axe, finishing axe, they're like two, two, three kilos, uh, a, lot, a lot heavier because that also comes with, well, technology in the time and uh, efficiency that changed in the ones and what objective people want in the time. But uh, just to give you an example, me hewing with 13th century tools, I'm able basically to uh, do uh, a feet, so 30 centimeter by 30 centimeter or feet by a fit by seven meter long per day in oak. Uh, with a clean finish, no problem, and do that all day, every day, even the next day without any problem. If I go to some more modern tools, axes like 19th century axes, uh, I can go up to nine meters a day uh, easily. Uh, and doing, and not, I'm not doing 10 hours a day at, at all. Mm -hmm. uh, so, knowing that also in the medieval periods, uh, you, there was another question already about uh, if you, if I make uh, my buildings, if I, how do I join uh, wood type and building, or wood shape and building when queuing. And you can see also building style construction have evolved with uh, forests and the tools they have. And like the 13th century building, they have some quite small timbers. Usually it's quite rare on medieval building to some something bigger, basically than 15 centimeters by 15 centimeters, so six by six inches. And so that gives you the opportunity to also have lighter axes, no problem. Uh, so yeah, it's it's not slave work at, at all. It's just like needed to get your body to it, the right technique, and yeah, just endurance work, uh, and not like heavy. It's not like pet sewing. Pet sewing is is a hard job and like really horrible job. Not bad. I've I've heard an argument made, and it seems a sensible one to me that. If you compare, say, agricultural tools like um, bill hooks for harvesting or pruning, yeah. there's so many hundreds and thousands of variations of shape, size, weight, balance. It must have been the case that a tiny little difference in the tool could make your working day more productive, less tiring, more efficient, and it mattered. And you'd have to get to a point where you could do a day's work again and again and again uh, repeatedly without becoming unfit. Yeah. 
yeah um, that, that's for sure and that's like i was uh, saying exactly you have all the because it's custom fitted to what you want to do yeah of course if you have a building again just using one hour a day half the year because that's where you're not working your agricultural or doing something else well that's okay if you're into an everyday tool you're gonna modify it to have it perfectly for example if i work in my garden i don't mind what spade i use yeah. if i've got an acre of ground i would care yeah, yeah. that's basically it. so for example this axe uh is a pattern i've made and i have it forged for me to my specification to use it to that's my go-to tool and with this one i can work all day every day from tree to spoon no problem. and i have a friend of mine who views this and say i like it but not and so he had a similar one forge mm. that's basically the same edge length the same weight but the socket is a bit shorter and he has like um a steel insert in back and it's a bit the edge is more parallel to the to the edge so made by the same blacksmith same quantity of material but the usage is a lot different uh, it's really not the same sensation when you use those two uh, compared to one another so yeah that's the small tiny amount can have a lot of influence on your usage of course yeah. fascinating thank you very much no problem thank you very much andy uh, i think we're on to jero um there we go yes uh yeah or i'm an old so um my question is i have two main questions um the first one is about um sharpening and um when you do experimental archaeology um i would be interested if you have um a historical sharpening method um with um natural stones or what works best for you it's um of course connected to the edge geometry too so um how do you use um turning round stones sometimes for um the rough grinding and um then use sandstones or uh or do you use um micro bevels or um do you always treat the whole um whole bevel? Yes. This so would be the first question. Um sharpening. Well, really depends also what I use the axe for. So my primary axe, which is my carpentry axe, I well, I'm not gonna speak about the forging process and when it's made. Once I've got my axe from the blacksmith, it's the edge already made. So I don't have like big chips to remove off. So yeah, I have quite a clean edge. If you have a lot of material to remove, usually we used to have a natural wheel stone. One person turning the wheel, the other one just rough grinding. Uh, and then we would go to basically hand stones, natural hand stone. And then you have like basically like any grid because you can use uh, basically any stones you have around to sharpen if you want to. Uh, so that's not a hard part to have a handstone and you don't need to have it straight at all you can have bumps in your stone for an act it's still going to work uh, so that's one thing about sharpening uh, usually the when i do sharpening uh, my geometry will depend on which axe i use for example my forestry axe uh, i want to have an edge that's are going to work more if I get it's going to get more damage using for it to work if there is stones around I'm going to cut off bark so I have an edge that I'm going to take a lot less care of uh, than my um, chain axe uh, but basically I'll use the same sharpening techniques when I sharpen on all the objects just there's one I won't let it dull too much the other one if it gets dull it's not a big deal I'll sharpen, have to spend more time sharpening it and I usually I'm some, I want to have an edge that's not too hard uh, because an edge that's too hard, if, if you get a chip in it, you're going to have a long time to remove it. So I want an edge that's just hard enough to hold the, the, the edge, but soft enough so I can sharpen it quite easily in the field if I need to. Uh, for edge geometry, precisely. So. Uh, so uh, you have, uh, I would say, 
the, the most classical edge I have. You have, you could do, you would be that you have like a, a concave edge, you have a convex edge, you have perfectly flat, or you could have flat with a secondary bevel, basically. That's there. Is, you could go further with some even my different metal. For me, this for an axe. If you're only carving spoons in a clean workshop, okay, that's fine. But otherwise, no, never. That's too fragile for an axe. This, uh, well, I'm not Japanese, so I'm not going to spend three hours a day sharpening my axe before working. So I'm not never going to get a perfectly flat uh, sharp edge. Uh, one. This is very interesting. Uh, if you have, for me, very thin axes, and you use it mostly for forestry work, because that gives you the opportunity to have a very thin edge, and with that bevel at the end, to still have the resistance uh, for uh, most of your work. But yeah, no, it's not my. I prefer a convex one because if you have. You could imagine this one being just one bevel here and a secondary bevel there. But that angle here uh, will like bumps off when you are screen or making planks or cleaning. So getting that rounded corner will give you will give you those nice colors when hewing and cleaning. So that for me is not a lot nicer. So usually I go on convex. So when I do sharpening, I'll basically I'll I'll start using my stones or Bell grinder or anything I want or farm, depending on what I use. I'll like, I would say, aim for perfect flat, but I know I'm never going to get that flat because that's a lot of work to get the perfect flat edge. So it's going to be aiming that flat for that angle, and I know the end of it, I'm not going to bother. It's going to be slightly con convex to have that resistance, and that's what, what I like for most of my work with basically. Aiming between 25 to 30 degree angle, depending on the use. So, a 27 angle for me is a good middle ground. But also, if we speak about angles, uh, when I was speaking about hewing with double bevel axes, this here, the wider your, your angle is, the further your hands are going to be from the, he the surface you're going to hew, the thinner your angle. So, if you have too much of an angle, it's going to be a lot tiring on your wrist. If you have too thin of an angle, you're going to hit your knuckles. And I find that that 25, 27 degree angle gives you the right balance between a good cutting edge that's going to be durable, even if your edge isn't that hard, when it's quite soft still, and still give you the um, space to have your hands free from the log most of the time if you have a decent sized color on your axe. Yeah. That's about it. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Very interesting. A lot of my uh, question about this. Um, the other question is about um, what you said about the handle. If the tarot is open, closed, um, or aligned, um, could you further explain this, um, which effect um, each um, type has? Yeah. Uh, so uh, it has a lot of effect depending on what you want to do. Um, so, for example, I know most of on the American uh, selling and American forestry services, they want to have the axe handle a line. This is the easiest thing to control uh, the axe when you do your felling, for example. And you have to imagine also, if, if I talk about purely felling purpose, uh, you have your tree, which is round, if you see it from the top. You have your first notches that fell, and you come with your back, 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 back cut. So your edge, during your back cut, you want to have straight to your edge of the axe, basically. If, well. Uh, if that's my axe here, I want to have the handle coming. If it's angle, you, it's easier to side down if it's a line, you got angle cut. If it's too far in, you're all go also going to be on the wrong side of a tree. It's going to fail. So you're in the side of the tree that's going to fail and you don't see the notch drop failing. 
if it's parallel, well, it's okay. And if it's off, still okay. You can see your cut just a bit harder to control. Uh, if you, for example, if your angle is open on an axe, uh, let's say that's here, that's the face of the log you're hewing. You have your axe edge, usually you want it when you're hewing, so you have the axe edge coming roughly level. So you cut the grain. It's a, you have a nice cut in your grain, and you're less tearing out the grain if you have grain run outs or like fibers direction moving. So you have here. If you have your handle coming upwards, your hands are again more off the way of the log, so you're sure not to bump into the log when queuing. If it's parallel, well, your hands are going parallel to the log when queuing, which is nice. If it's a line, that's a very weird thing to understand. Uh, it's that oh, I'm going to trade this way. Uh, if, so this here, the plan is the face of the log I'm hewing. If I get here, so I said the axe that has a parallel edge, my handle is just going to be uh, just to try to see the handle is going to be parallel there. If it's coming upwards to so an open angle. The angle is going to be like, basically like this. You can see it going up and further from the log. If it's a line, you're going to, since it's going to be a line, it's going to be like this. So the end of the handle just slightly going to touch the end of the log. So you're going to be a, need to angle it a bit and work more with the tip of the axe. So the tip here. So you do. So if you're handling the axe at the end, you're not hitting your hands. If your axe is the angle coming in, basically the handle's bumping. If you want to be perfectly flat, your, hand, your handle's bumping the the log, so you can't go down. So that's one effect we'll have on you. Personally, on so my axe has the handle that comes inward. Which okay is not perfect for hewing. So if I don't want to bump my hand when hewing bigger logs, I'm just hewing the first using the first half of my edge. I can't use all the edge, so I'm less efficient in hewing. But to prevent this from being too much of a problem, this axe has quite a long collar. So if I hew less than this, which is the case of most of the timbers and the timber frame. You're not going to hit your hands because your hands are going to be above the log you're hewing. And that's how you prevent it from being too much of a problem. Yeah, that's some of the different advantages and inconvenience of the edge alignment uh, on your axe. Basically, if you have a doubt or you don't really know, I would say the easiest thing to use is something that's not perfectly parallel, slightly inwards, but not aligned, like that would go around here. That's for me, that's the easiest and nicest thing to have, to have quite useful. If it's too much aligned, and it's going to be a bit annoying sometimes. If it's parallel, it's going to be annoying some other times. So, just also an idea why I have this axe edge aligned inwards, which is quite rare. That's, that's not typical. Usually, you don't have those kind of angles coming that much steep into the, the handle. I have it this way because. When you do your hewing, so you have that round log here, and you can stand on the log and having your axe to make your notches when juggling, and you're still standing, so you'll need it. There'll be a man here standing on the log while hewing. And then you have your axe coming here, and you want to have the notches coming plumb. But when you're working on smaller timbers, like 13th century size timber, which is like doing 10 by 10 centimeters or Standing on the log, and it's not very nice. You're, it's easy to fall or just chop your feet off. So usually you're going to working behind the log. And so having that weird angle on my axe makes me that I don't have to twist my my wrist too much to have my axe head coming plumb, still holding the axe behind. So my so I know my notches are naturally plumb and easier than for hewing. And same thing. So when I'm going to that's for when I want it plumb, but when I want it level to make my notches for hue, for, for example, making a tenon shoulder. 
having that angle will give me the opportunity to have my edge standing level with my log on trestles instead of having to bend my wrists. So I'm like losing efficiency on hewing, but on finishing hewing, but I'm gaining efficiency on notching and joinery making. So that's how I choose to go with it. But yeah, for heavy duty hewing, clearly it's not a hewing axe, it's a carpentry and timber framing axe, more than just a hewing axe. Yes, thanks for a um, smaller weapons. Do you use um, patches, patches too, or do you always um, use the long handle? Um, um, a patches um, means for me that um, you have a short handle and um, use it one handed on a chopping block. Um, and if you um, use um, hatchets, um, which is you, your preferred one that you use? Uh, well, usually uh, I have some well, different sort of hatchets, but with, with those kind of handle length, which is 60 centimeter, I'm able to two handed and one handed, no problem. And that's what I like about length. And this one, the 1.7 kilo head, I use it one handed most of the time. Uh, when, well, when I need to, I can just use it one handed, no problem. Uh, and for hatchets, that I have like quite a wide panel of hatchets, really depending on the task I want to do. Uh, but usually I still keep some quite long handles on my hatchets, like 45 centimeters long handles on hatchets. Because they're not going in the they're not, I'm not, they're not in my way when working. And I want to have that option to take it very far end of the handle and like have that weaving hatch action to really cut very far and very efficiently and very fast if I need to. And then when I go to carving, I could just chalk up the hand closer to the axe head to use it. So yeah, that's uh, that's why for me, I have like I have no axes with a handle shorter than 35 centimeters uh, because I don't see the use in it. And well, I got if you're only doing spoon carving or like small carving, why not? But I don't see the use in that anyhow. Like even for example, my sixth century axe, which has a 300 grams head, I have a 50 centimeter handle on it. And that's one of my favorite ha hatchets I have. Because uh, like, yeah, you do a lot, a lot of work with it just by, the, by having that handle longer. And that's not in my way. Uh, now that I'm thinking of it, I have one axe that has a shorter handle. <laughs> Say so the axe I have and I use that has the shortest handle with this one, which is a minor axe. Uh, and this one, which has like yeah, 30, roughly 30, 35 handle. Uh, well, that's the typical size of handle you have on minor axes. Uh, and that's because you're working in like close quarters and like upside down buildings in small spaces. And that's why you want to have the short handle because otherwise you can't work. And this one, I use it when I'm doing restoration work and I don't have space to work, but that's only time I use it basically. So, yeah. Thank you. So, <laughs> that's very interesting. Well, thank you very much, Gustav, um, for a brilliant talk tonight. And you've answered loads of really interesting questions as well thank you thank you very much for that um i think this is the time at the end of our talk where we uh thank our guest speaker and we also raise a glass to the bench so thank you gustav gustav on the bench cheers to the bench on the bench yes gustav on the bench